Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Safford and this is Kitco News. Make sure you hit subscribe now to get the latest on markets and commodities. Now today on the show, we dive into Canada's economic future. Could a new approach be the solution? Well, our guest today is Frank Stronach, an immigrant from Austria whose journey made him a Canadian billionaire, synonymous with innovation in the business world globally. Now, he's best known for founding Magna International, a global powerhouse in the automotive industry, recognized as one of the largest and most diversified auto parts suppliers in the world, with a market cap of about $20 billion. Now, Frank was one of the first pioneers of employee profit sharing. He revolutionized the automotive industry in 1974 by creating a workforce with a vested interest in the company's success. Stronach also temporarily entered politics. He formed a party in Austria fighting for fiscal and social reforms. Frank is now advocating for an economic charter of rights in Canada, but will this charter steer the country towards a more stable and equitable economy? He believes it's time for a shift. Is he right? Well, let's welcome him to the show now. Frank Stronach, welcome to Kitco News. Well, nice to be here. I appreciate your time today. I know it's valuable, and, and I kind of want to start here by talking about, you know, you've built a reputation as a visionary in business world. Uh, you've seen Canada through many economic cycles. From your perspective, what are the most critical challenges facing Canada today? And what's our current leadership doing to help? Well, it's, uh, the system doesn't work anymore, right? Because our debt's climbing every year, our bureaucracy is climbing, and uh, we have less and less exports and more and more imports. So that's uh, the recipe for a major disaster. And talk to me a little bit about when this started to happen. I mean, what is the current leadership doing to help fill these gaps? You were talking a little bit well, about, you know. Uh, let's take a look. 50 years ago, when the first computers came on the market, the slogan was, if you get one of those computers, you can, uh, you can close a total office floor. When I look around in the cities now in Canada and the States and Europe, the cities got 20 times more office buildings. So what do you think they're doing there? They don't make products in there. It's regulations, regulations, and financial transactions. So that's a yeah. major problem. So, but look, let's face it. The world has always been dominated by the golden rule. Where's the gold or the money makes the rule? So I don't want to be dominated by anyone. If I feel that strong, I should not be able to dominate somebody either. So the question is, how can we dismantle the chains of dominations? Not by violent revolutions, by revolutions of the mind. And the revolutions of the mind, we got to create economic charters of rights. Okay, let's get into this economic charter of rights uh, that you're talking about. Give us a little bit of a detail as to the key components here okay, and explain me, how it's going to address these problems. Let me, let me explain it in a simple way. Yeah. Every all politicians, all business people, and most other people agree if the economy doesn't work, nothing else will work. You cannot feed the hungry. He cannot look after the most fragile people, the elderly, the sick, the handicapped. But we do not talk what drives the economy. The economy is driven by three forces, smart managers, hardworking employees, and investors. The message what I want to get loud and clear across the, across the world is, Workers have a moral right to some of the profits they help to generate. Without workers, you cannot, change, can, you cannot generate any profit, period. So it's, those are the fundamental of an economic chart of rights. Do uh, right now, the divide is just too big between the very rich and the working class. And uh, it, it uh, hopefully it doesn't come to violent revolutions down the, uh, down the road. So the very key is, can we sort things out with the revolution of, of the mind? Yeah, interesting. I mean, back in 1974, you introduced profit sharing at Magna. And would you say that it's been one of those, uh, you know, it's probably driven that company into the success that it is, people having skin in the game. Are you asking for that same thing to happen today? Well, exactly. Like when I put down 
the corporate constitution, part of the, co the, the main principle of the constitution was what we do with the profits. But anyway, part of the constitution was that workers over and above their wages and the wages had to be average to the competition within the region. But over and above the wages, they get 10% of the profits. The first year when they put in the constitution or the profit sharing program, uh, our profits went up 40%. The second year, they went up 100%. The third year, 200%. When you get employees involved in tangible terms, you release an energy of outdoor proportions, okay? Because the workers on the front line, they know how to make things better. And if they know they get a cut or portion of it, they got to be extra more careful. So that's the very, very key. We got to, we need economic charters of rights. Economic charter of rights will eliminate poverty. So I just want to be clear, though, you're not talking about more overreach in the market when you're talking about the charter. Explain that a little bit. You're not coming in with uh, more governmental overreach here. You still believe in capitalism. Oh, no, no, yeah, I'd be happy to explain. It, everything is an evolutionary process. Let's look way back. You had the caveman, then you had the hunter and the hunted, then you had the kings and the servants, and now you have the bosses and disgruntled employees. The reason why I did well, I treated my workers as partners. Mm -hmm. And we are not doing that, right? So that's why you got the unions, that you got labor unrest. Because the workers know the playing field is not level. You know, I have a question about the current debt. I mean, you highlighted concerns about Canada's growing national debt. I'm curious about what specific policies you think you could recommend to tackle the issue. I mean, it's almost as though the current government's coming out with $20 billion worth of, uh, you know, public displays of, of photo ops and announcements every week right now. Well, what you have here, as I said earlier on, the, the interest alone on the debt we have is $120 million uh, a day. What do we, what's the future look for our kids? It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's dramatic, right? So what we have to do is we, we, need, we need some economic principles to, to make sure that Canada is on a sound economic foundation. Because if the foundation isn't right, you, you can't fix anything and, and you're heading for disasters. So I developed a seven-point program, which is non-political, it's purely economically what we should do. And I hope the public will buy into it. Well, this is interesting. Obviously, we're going to ask everyone to go and check those out. And I'll talk a little bit more about them. But how do you see the principles universally applied across industries uh, to improve economic well, fairness? Okay. The problem what we have, governments shouldn't have that. Huh? So right. basically, point one, I got a seven-point program. Point one, or the first principle is within 20 years, the government should be debt-free. They should pay, pay back the debt. The next thing is our bureaucracy is like crazy. It's growing crazy. But anyway, in a civilized country, every citizen got the right to find a job, whatever the openings are. It's not the people. It's the system at fault. So, but basically, no bureaucrat would be laid off. We just have a program that a dandy hiring freeze that will, that will come down to about 50%. Number three is we have a tax system. It's, there's thousands and thousands of paragraphs and that they're more convoluted than, than any, anything else. And nobody knows how that works. And that's got to, we need a straight, a straight tax system, black and white. The rich pay more than the poor and uh, no loopholes. Income is income, right? Doesn't matter. So just have a simple tax system. Uh, so that's, uh, that's point three. Point four is we must be careful not to destroy free enterprise. Free enterprise is the basis for free society. So I'm saying three, uh, companies below 300 employees can purely operate the free enterprise system or the capitalistic system. And when they grow over 300 employees, 
then by law, they have to share the profits with the employees. So that was the, the, the fifth pro pro uh, principle. The sixth pro principle is high school should end at grade 10, and then kids should be in grade 11 and grade 12 should be exposed to trade. To teach, uh, I think the kids would uh, benefit greatly, their, their knowledge would increase, and society would increase because a lot of kids will like to stay with the trades, but if the ones which want to go to university can go to university. So, but anyway, that's the, the, the sixth principle. The seventh one is no Canadian kid should go to school hungry. That means breakfast got to be served. No Canadian kid should leave the school hungry. That means lunch has got to be served, but by law. The food has to be organic because we poison our cats. The pesticide, the fungicide we, 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 we spray in industrial farms. You see, no more eagles fly. Why? There's no more rabbits. There's no more pheasants. We kill everything. And, uh, and uh, you know, the pesticide, fungicide gets in the air. We breathe the air, gets in the water. We drink the water and gets in the soil. We eat the food. And all our kids have this, have uh, they have allergies. Stage two diabetics is enormous, so we we got to be careful. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that your passion lies within that or organic food. And we can get into a little bit on the EV side too. Before we do, I'm curious. I, I brought off the top that you've you know you've dealt with a lot of governments in your day. It's obviously comes in cycles. How bad are we as a nation right now in terms of policy? How difficult is it to invest into this country? Well, I could never build a magna anymore, right? I mean, I started in a garage and I built a company with 180,000 employees, mm -hmm. over 400 factories. So I created 400 uh, small, uh, small companies, right? So I could never, because the bureaucracy is about two to 300% more than it was 40, 50, 60 years ago, right? So it's, uh, so the, the economic uh, arteries are blocked with cholesterol, right? So we yeah. gotta be, we gotta go about in a sensible way. And I said, no bureaucrat has to be afraid to be fired, but we have a hiring freeze, right? So we need a task for us. How can we intelligently uh, and that, uh, how can we, slowly uh, have less and less bureaucrats, right? Because it's yeah, gone so, up in normal. So the bureaucracy cut some of the fat, as they say. Uh, Frank, in your view, what are the largest barriers to economic growth in Canada today? And, and what kind of initiatives would you propose to overcome those barriers? Well, it would be the bureaucracy, right? The ambient, right. You gotta, I think you got to create a special task for us. I think there will be a lot of successful businessmen, let's say business people who's created a lot of jobs. And they would, I think they would volunteer the time and they would, uh, they would sit down and say, look, uh, there's uh, hundreds of paragraphs and they, they would say, we don't need this paragraph, no, we don't need this paragraph, et cetera, et cetera. Only two rules will apply. Workplace safety and you cannot dump poison cabbages in your backyard. But otherwise, everything could be dismantled. Let's talk a little bit about the most critical areas where government efficiency can be improved, obviously without undermining essential public services or you know, regulatory functions. But where do you think this is? It's, it almost seems as though it's more difficult to bring your products to market in this country. No, to bring the product. Uh, look, if, if the bureaucracy is so high, that would the product would reflect that your cost would be high on, 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 on the product, right? Let me just give you an example. I got about uh, 10 years ago very heavily in the agriculture, right? Mm -hmm. I got some farms here in Aurora where I basically where I live, right? And uh, so I built a greenhouse for a greenhouse. It didn't need a permit, but I wanted to build a farmer's market in front of the greenhouse. I'm waiting for three years now to get a permit. That's got to tell you everything. Imagine well three years and I just want to sell organic food to people. So that should tell you everything. This is critical. This is crazy. 
But where did this all start? I mean, where did this new evolution of this politics start to develop? Oh, where but they can't get anything done. Be, um, yeah, but uh, the bureaucrats get paid. Doesn't matter. They don't have to produce anything, uh, and uh, and uh, somehow uh, bureaucrats say, "Gee, I gonna show that top business businessman who is boss." Okay, so it did. Uh, yeah, it, it look three years to get a to get a, a permit to build a farmers market. That's got to tell you everything. It's beyond. It's beyond craziness. What, looking back at your career, would be the biggest differentiators between being able to build a business in Canada and now, waiting three years for that permit? Well, uh, 40, 50, 60, Canada was a nice place. People were helpful. They had an administration in municipalities. Yeah, you got to do this. You had a permit within two, two, two weeks, right? Everybody was helpful, but now it seems... Everybody is against something. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, I could never build a magna anymore. You could never build a magna. Do you find that the same oversight is in the new, you know, farming agricultural communities as well? Well, uh, that again is a major, major problem. The family farms are practically on welfare. And we, when we look back in, in history, Family farms were always the backbone of a country. A country which could feed itself never had a problem. But now family farms have a major problem. They're practically on welfare. Kids of family farmers say, Mom, Dad, I don't want to be in farming. I don't want to be on welfare. Because family farms cannot compete with industrial farms. But industrial farms, uh, they use a lot of chemicals, right? Yeah. You know, off the top of the interview, you were talking a little bit about these workshops as well as factories and how we have an imbalance in this country. I'm curious if you can elaborate a little bit on this and maybe talk to me about how far behind we are. How long do you think it's going to take us to catch up? Well, it's, uh, we got to be, it might have a major problem because the skilled labor they get on an age, right? The skilled labor came from Scotland, from England. Germany, from Austria, from Italy, because they had great trade schools over there. So uh, all those uh, specialized tradesmen, they get re retired, right? Mm -hmm. So how we we are not we are not teaching trades, we are not teaching high skills, right? Without that thing, you can't make products. And if you go in a large department store nowadays, you hardly see any any products made in Canada. That again should tell you something. We got a major problem. A major problem is our political system doesn't function. Yeah. And the biggest holes in that political system are just oversight, but also fiscal spending and fiscal mismanagement. No, oh, it's, it's basically what we have that uh, if you come forward with a new program, you're going to be defeated because you could be criticized. And for me, maybe one of the greatest statesmen, a politician, was Winston Churchill. And before he died, he said on numerous occasions, Parliament, politics doesn't work. He says, we need a chamber of citizens, hmm. okay, to balance out the politics. That's what we need. And that's why I'm saying that the most important thing is that we, that uh, small businesses, we take the red tape of small business and let them operate. Yeah, and let them let them make some monies, and that would uh, we could generate. Uh, you know, we could generate the economy because if small business does well, the whole country would do well. Because small business, they all will play on the same level of playing field. Right now, our income tax caters to special interest groups. Mm -hmm. That's the dilemma. D tell me more about that a little bit. Well, it's so if you, uh, look, uh, can I have, a, uh, I got, uh, I got uh, the codex here by any chance, right? So just, this is a book here, right? <laughs> it's just thousands and thousands of paragraphs in there. One is more convoluted than other, and they serve special interest groups. You know, right. when you, uh, man, when you, when you just look at any page, 
if it wouldn't be so serious, it would be a, it would be comedy to the health, right? You would laugh so ridiculous, so convoluted. Yeah, but yet our taxes are going up and our debt is going up even with that book. Well, because we because we we pay for more and more people which don't do anything. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's tough. So we uh, we uh, look, we uh, I've developed a seven point economic uh, principles. And uh, we hope to uh, to convince small business how important that is. In every political writing, there's 338 writings. We want to have a small. Uh, we want to have an office of small businesses, and uh, the small businesses will agree on the seven economic principles. And if you, as a politician, don't agree to that, you wouldn't be elected. That's what we. That's a chamber. Of, Oh, call it of citizens. It's small. It's yeah. small business. Chamber of citizens. Well said. Uh, before I let you go, Frank, uh, you talk to a lot of community business people. You talk to globally. Uh, you talk to a lot of business people globally. Obviously, I'm curious just how bad it is for small businesses and people. And just you know, we see carbon taxes going up. We see debt crises around the country. It's more expensive at the grocery store than ever before. Uh, is this change going to take place? Well, it's uh, hopefully, hopefully I've created uh, seven principles, which are very simple, but they would help the, the economic foundation greatly. And unless we put a solid foundation in, the country will go broke. Yeah. 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 It's not too far yeah. from servicing that uh, debt. We could set you... Where people want to know more about, we have an economic charter of rights, right? It's, uh, we, uh, maybe, uh, let me see, uh, it's the economic charter of rights CA. Join the grassroots the movement, regenerate Canada. Yeah, and we'll go, I'll make sure that the audience goes. You can learn more at Frank's charter at www.economiccharter.com. Dot CA. Hey, Frank, thanks for making the time for us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on and talking. Okay, we'll do it again to keep the public informed. I look forward okay. to that. Frank Stronach joining us today. On right. Go. Frank, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Great to be with you. Thank you. Great. Great to be with you. Much appreciated. Uh, fascinating yes. interview. Fascinating things. As I mentioned off the top, you can learn more about Frank's charter at www.economiccharter.com. .ca. I'm Jeremy Saffron for Kitco News. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, and we'll see you next time.